friendly librarian and I'm back for some book love so let's chat. I know it looks like chaos but it's not. This is very organized and I am ready to talk to you. I'm ready to talk to you about some books that I've read since the last time we chatted. I'm ready to talk to you about some updates especially like book hauls that I didn't have reviews out there for. It is summertime. I am a teacher during the school year so uh, now that summertime has started I have gotten caught up on some of those reviews. So I want to touch base with some of those, recommend them to you, tell you a little bit about the books. Ignore Stella. She's snorting at something out in the backyard. Um, not all of these I'm going to be able to talk to you about because I've been working on updating those Goodreads reviews and I haven't gotten through all of them, but I plan to. Give me just a second, Stella. Um, I do have some more book hauls from the last time that I talked to you, which if we um, trust our little calendar here was maybe Friday, May 12th, the last time that I videoed. And then I think I released that video on June 1st because we had a little bit of craziness. I know end of school and then some family um, things. So I think that's, I'm pretty sure that's when I released the last video. Today is June 10th, Saturday, June 10th. So I will be filming today and I hope to edit and get that video out honestly pretty quickly now that it is summertime. I am working on, um, I'm looking forward to a trip to see my cousin in Florida in the next few days. Um, so pretty excited about that, but I think I can squeeze in editing this video and getting it out. So pretty excited about that. I keep telling you in the summer, I'm going to make more videos and I feel like this is good progress towards that. Um, so let's talk about some of these things. It is Saturday morning. So the light coming in my window is amazing. It is lovely outside. I am aware I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt, but that's because it says Book Diva and I haven't worn this book shirt yet. So crazy enough, um, I'm trying to get in all those book related shirts in my videos. Uh, so if you do look back, if you are paying attention, you might notice that I have not worn the same shirt twice, I don't think. Probably should look back and fact check that, but I'm pretty sure. So welcome back. I hope that we get to spend a little bit of time in my library. You know it's one of my favorite things to do if you are um, not new here. If you are new here, welcome. Boy, am I going to have some suggestions for you. So please make sure you have your handy dandy to be read list out and ready so we can add to it. And thanks for coming. Give me a minute to clear off the table and then we'll get started. All right, that's taken care of. Looks a lot better, right? This is what it always looks like at the beginning of the video. Chaos and then clear the table off and take care of those stacks one by one. I am pretty methodical about it. It's one of the things I super enjoy doing. Um, so once again, welcome back. Let's chat. We'll start off with setting up the table like we normally do. Um, this morning, I am drinking water out of my Coffee Fox from Savannah, Georgia, Coffee Fox um, glass. Because yesterday, me, my mom, and my sister, we often like to kick off summer with a little bit of a short trip. This was just a day trip. We didn't even spend the night, but it was amazing. However, uh, we started early, you know, like 7 o'clock, and then I got back at 11 o'clock, something like that. Um, and I had three coffees throughout the day, strawberry tea, an Italian lemonade, a lot of water <laughs> and um, a wine tasting, but I mean, it was the smallest wine tasting I've ever seen. It was good. Still bought a bottle of wine, but it was tiny. So I don't even, I'm not even going to count that. Uh, but through all of that, like I couldn't even get up and have a cup of coffee this morning because today <laughs> I'm headed to a wine walk. Once again, such is the life of a teacher. We are so busy during the school year and Sometimes that means you just don't get to participate in fun things or um, like events or whatever that's going on because you're just like in survival mode. So once summer starts, 
I like say yes, yes, yes to like everything that goes out there. Um, and that's good and bad. Like I love rejoining society and being able to take um, part in all the fun things. But it also means that like, especially for a while, I, I just go to all the things and I drink and eat all the food and participate in all the activities. And I know with the wine walk coming up today and my full day yesterday, I better be really hydrating. <laughs> that would make a lot of sense. Let's reset our calendar. What did I say today is? Today is Saturday, the 10th of June. Fabulous. So we'll stick that out there in case you're wondering what day it was actually filmed on. And then we are returning to our sexy library and candle for today. Or if you uh, have been watching my, my videos, you know I bought this at Wheatberry books in Chillicothe, Ohio on one of my last girl weekends. Lovely. And my phone says it's at 20% and it's 10 o'clock in the morning. So I have been listening today to um, uh, an audiobook, and quite frankly, like it's kind of hard for me to sit down and film this video because I have 40 Oh, sorry, we're down to 36 minutes left in this audiobook. It is called Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone by Benjamin Stevenson, and it is superb. I love it. He just revealed the killer at 35 minutes left to go, um, and I do want to finish it, but I really want to film this video, and I want to just let you soak in that morning light in my library. It is so pretty in here in the mornings, and today is like the perfect day. So we're going to film, and then, you know, there's a lot of... Um, downtime whenever I'm filming these videos and so I just keep, keep hitting play when we have the downtime and I will probably be through the book when I'm finished filming the video so it will work out it'll all work out but we will talk about everybody in my family has killed someone later um not in this video because I won't have the review ready for it but I am loving it highly recommend it murder mystery especially Agatha or Dorothy Sayers fans get this book. Audio is fabulous, but I'm sure the other one is too. I actually have a copy of the book. I picked it up at the library after I started listening to this because it had referenced some things and I'm like, what does that look like in print form? Um, sometimes a book, even though it's a really good audio, I just need to see it in print. Like how is it set up? Um, so I picked it up from the library. So glad I did. Love it, love it, love it. I'm telling you it's going to be a five star. So go ahead and get that on your um, to be read list and we'll talk about it later. All right, let's take a look at those books that I have read since the last time that we have talked. Um, it takes me a minute to like get them set up here. It doesn't look like a very big stack, I know, but that's because I listened to a lot of audiobooks this time, so I'm not gonna have a ton of ones to show you, and that's okay, it always seems to work out. Uh, but we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine looks like we have like nine books to talk about um since the last time that we have met and then of course i do have a ton of other ones but let's get started on these first up we have kate carlisle dressed to drill um again if you're new here you may not know so i'll just refresh but if you have been here before you may realize that i um, have read all the kate carlisle's up until this point except for her spinoff series and that, uh, this is part of the Fixer Up Mystery Series. It's a cozy mystery. I also love her Bibliophile Mystery Series. And full disclosure, I am a Kate's Raider, which means she does send me a free copy of her books when they are published um, in exchange for honest reviews, which I do. Um, and I've been doing that for several years. I love the opportunity to do that. If you are looking up on my shelves, I believe the Kate Carlisles are right here. See all those. Um, so I have the Bibliophile Mystery Series, and I also have the um, Fixer Upper Mystery Series. So they do look great on a shelf. Looks like that, I believe. Is that right? This way. There you go. Uh, they do look good on a shelf, and they're just the perfect size for a cozy mystery. See that size there? So this one has 326 pages, which is pretty average for one of her books. 
I want to say that the Bibliophile Mystery Series, those I usually get mailed to me and they're usually in hardback, but for some reason, Fixer Up Mystery Series always comes in paperback. Why is that? I don't really know. Um, but I love both of her series. I used to say Bibliophile Mystery Series was my favorite of the two, but I feel like it's kind of evening out. I really like the Fixer Upper Mystery Series. It focuses on the main character. Her name is Shannon Hammer. Very punny, I know, but Cozy Mysteries, you have to have punny titles, punny characters, things that happen like that. Um, but Shannon Hammer fixes up houses in the California area. Am I right? I feel like it's California. Um, <clears throat> she mainly fixes up like Victorian or historical houses. She's super talented. She has a great team of people. This meets all those little cozy um, things like a small community of people um, that are very tight, very good friends. Um, this particular one focuses on Shannon Hammer's business. Most cozies, the main character has a business like a bookshop or um, a library. There's like, I think I need to cut my wick down. I'll do that during the next break. Um, <clears throat> Likeable and despicable characters. They are dogs. They are cats. They are love interests. In this particular one, Shannon, shock and surprise, starts a new project, finds a dead body. <clears throat> as much as the police are actively pursuing this case, she also has special interest in the case. So she is also um, pursuing who, uh, who has committed the murder in this particular instance. Now, I have absolutely no interest in redoing a house or doing construction work, but I really find the um, work, like career chat in this particular series, really interesting. When she is talking about all the steps that you have to take to refurbishing a historical place or how you go about um, doing some of those things without, um, you know, hurting the, the historical integrity of a particular building is super interesting. I highly enjoy it. I think it really adds to the mystery. I always like revisiting Shannon, the community, the people in the community, her family and her relationships. The story definitely moves forward in this particular one. It's nicely timed. It's another one of those things that I really need my cozies to be perfectly timed. Like you can tell me the um, murder in the very beginning. A lot of Cleo Coils do that. It starts off with the, the murder. Um, usually she sets up her story. So the timing is more like, a fourth to a third of the way through the book before you end up with the murder. It's not in the first two chapters, usually. Um, and I like that kind of timing too, so I've already kind of gotten into the story and I'm being reeled in before, bam, here comes a dead body. This one does also focus on her love interest, Max, career. He is a writer. Um, some of his books have been turned into movies. Um, I wanna say he's former something which gives him that that um, insight, I can't remember what it is though. But he, one of his books is being turned into a movie so we do get a little bit of that backstory also. And then I feel like there was something cool about her dedication to this book. Oh yeah, that's right. So I follow Kate Carlisle on all social media. I like to keep up with her that way. And I remembered her running a bit of a, um, uh, I don't know if it was a contest or she just kind of threw it out there and she's like, help me name Max movie for the book. And uh, it is dedicated to Joanne H who named Max movie. And when I read that, I was like, oh, that's right. I remember that little, um, you know, thing that they did on her social media and I thought it was super cute. So I um, highly recommend, uh, pretty sure I gave it four out of five stars, which is the most I've given, I'm pretty sure to most cozies. Uh, if I like them, they're usually three to uh, three out of five. If I really like them, they're four out of five. Um, super enjoyed this one, and I look forward to the next installment in either this series or the Bibliophile series. Plus, she has a couple of spinoffs that I need to track down and get caught up on. I need to do a breakout video just on Kate Carlisle. I know I've said that many times before, but it's summertime and my hopes are high. I did just realize that I told you I was going to wear my Hercule Perot um, I don't know, headband, I think is what you would probably call it that my girlfriend gave me for um, maybe my birthday, my, um, my coworker, the fellow Agatha lover, uh, Stephanie gave me for my birthday and I didn't do it, completely forgot. I was working on getting ready and I just didn't do it. So maybe next one, something to look forward to. One thing that I do have with me is my um, reduced tumbler, is that what you call these things? 
Um, I don't have a Stanley. I bought this a long time ago and I love it. It was from Kroger. It was pricier than I like to pay for a tumbler, but I loved the color and then I just added stickers. Um, I think the last time I told you that I had a Hercule Poirot sticker, so there is that. I also bought the Agatha sticker over spring break and then I have this be, what is it, read books, be kind, stay weird sticker and it says at Hello Lovely Box. So that one has a brand name on it. The other ones do not. Oh, I am officially a book wizard, not a bookworm. Love that one too. Those don't have um, brand names on them though. So I don't know where you get them, but I love them. So that was number 33, book for the year. Number 34 for the year is Murder Your Employer, The McMaster's Guide to Homicide by Rupert Holmes. I don't have a copy of this one, so I'm just going to talk to you about it. I listened to it on audio. It's super clever. Um, it just kept popping up in my feed. And so it's one of those that I'm like, come on, is the universe trying to tell me something? I guess I need to read this book. I'm going to do that instead of thinking about the title, Murder Your Employer, um, The McMaster's Guide to Homicide. It looks like a nonfiction book, like a guidebook. It is not. It is fiction. I promise you. Um, it's super good. It's funny. It's also heart wrenching when you learn backstories of people. Um, it did just come out this year. But man, I have seen this cover everywhere. Now, obviously, I follow a lot of book um, sites, book companies, publishers. You know, I follow a lot of those things, book groups. Um, and a lot of them have mystery as their genre of choice. So I'm sure that's why I hear it. But I want to say that this one probably popped up on my Libby suggestions. Uh, and knowing that it was an audio, I probably put it on hold and then waited. Sorry, let me move this for Stella. Here you go. Go ahead. Go. There you go. Um, put that back up there. I'm sorry, she needed to get on her bed. <laughs> um, it is set up with a fictional school that you are only recruited for. You can't sign up to go there. The school is not for young children, it's for adults. And it's when um, someone notices that you are either going to commit murder or that you are thinking about it and they will pursue you and try and teach you how to do that, how to commit murder, um, without getting caught. But you have to prove your case. You have to say like, why do you want to murder your employer? Why would you do that? And um, who would benefit from this? And who would it hurt? And you have to make your case. But then you attend their school and they will show you how to do that the right way um, as long as you have built your case. You have built your case. And then your final is if you complete your task and you don't get caught. So main character is talking you through his experience of being pursued during this um, endeavor that he sets out on and then how that works out if he passed the course. It's super good. I really liked it. Um, this is another one I super enjoyed on audio and I do think that it would have been a very good read too. Uh, you know, on, I love audio books. I get a lot of my books. I, you know, read about 100 books a year. Um, 70 to 100 and I feel like that I get closer to that 100 mark because I am reading or I'm reading so many books via audio and I do all of those through Libby through my public library. I don't purchase them. I don't have an Audible account. I'd love to. I can't pay for one more platform <laughs> but I do them through Libby and um, this is a really good audio but I do think it would also really be a great book just to um, read if you had a print copy. It's narrated by uh, Neil Patrick Harris and Simon Vance. It's definitely a thriller. It is so pleasurable. It's a bit complicated for an audio. I will give you that, like keeping up with it. I did have to rewind several parts because I started, you know, doing the laundry or the dishes or cleaning or whatever I normally do when I'm listening to an audio and I kind of got lost. So I did have to rewind it several times. It's a little more complicated than I like my audios to be. I loved the play on words. It's probably the most enjoyable thing about this book when it talked about deleting um, people instead of murdering them. They're very careful on how they state things. Um, your thesis instead of like, you know, killing someone. Like the, it's very unique. I really enjoyed it. I highly recommend it. I gave it a four out of five. Why not a five out of five? Again, maybe just because it took me a little bit longer here and there. I had to go back and rewind. 
Um, but I really enjoyed it. I highly recommend it. That takes us to a reread. Um, I, I'm not sure how I came across this series, but I love it. I'm going to get a little too much going on there. Um, but I absolutely love it. It is G.M. Millette's Wicked Autumn. Um, this is number one in the Max Tudor series. Now, I already read this and uh, reviewed it back in October. And then, um, then I realized that it was a series. And so then I read Fatal Winter, which is the second one in the Max Tudor series. Now, these are mystery series, not cozy. Um, you know, not classic. What do you call that? Modern mystery series, um, but in a classic style. So I read this. And then I read um, Fatal Winter, and I had Pagan Spring on my reading list. So when I went to read Pagan Spring, I'm like, you know what? I don't feel like I remember enough of the first two. I'm just going to go back and quickly, you know, listen to review. And then I didn't fly through them. I Well, I did fly through them, but I didn't like fast forward through them. I went back and just listened to both of those in order, and I loved it. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I actually did Fatal Winter. I did, actually. I, I listened to Fatal Winter first. Then I realized it was series and went back and did Wicked Autumn. So this time I wanted to do them in order. So I did Wicked Autumn, Fatal Winter, and then Pagan Spring. Uh, it, Pagan Spring or uh, Fatal Winter, I don't have a copy of either one of those. I listened to all of those on audio. Um, this one, I actually had the copy, um, the print copy. Mm. Pretty sure that that's how I read it. I don't know. The first time I just listened to the audio this time. But great mystery series. It is set on the main character, Max Tudor. He is a minister in a small English town. Uh, it is called Nether Monkslip. Um, if you like, like Father Brown or Monk or um, the... Penny, um, Louise Penny series. If you like those, you would really like this GM Millette. Highly recommend it. It's very traditional mystery, very Agatha-ish. The setting is lovely. The community is lovely. Um, the fact that Max is unmarried um, and he would love to have a love interest and kind of dabbles in that in the first two books definitely is set in the third book but um it presents its own set of problems notice that i'm smiling because it's a lovely plot twist i give all of these books five stars they are literary they are entertaining they are well written i love them I really enjoy seasonal reading. If you've been here, you know that about me. And these blend the perfect seasonal reading to a mystery series. The season is the backdrop for each one of these. Wicked Autumn. Autumn is important. Fatal Winter. The snow is important. Them getting snowed in is important. Um, and Pagan Spring. The Spring Festival is the setting and it is lovely. Now, my sister is upset that it's called Pagan Spring. She's like, I can't read it if it's going to be called Pagan. And I said, well, it's not really about Pagan. She's like, how is it not? Okay, maybe it is a little um, because one of the characters owns a shop. I'm not going to call it a Pagan shop, but she's not religious. She, um, it's not witchcraft. It's kind of hard to describe. Like, maybe the word for that is Pagan. I don't know. But, you know, I, if you watch my channel, you know, I am a spiritual, religious person. It does not offend me. I don't know. I don't know how else to say it other than that. I enjoy the character. Um, you know, like I said, the main character is a minister. Um, and I just find that fascinating. You can also go to GM Millette's website. It's a fabulous website. It has a map of Nether Monkslip and the surrounding areas. It also has the first two chapters um, of the book. So you can start reading it and see if you like it. I'm telling you, you're going to like it. Just trust me. Okay. But if you don't, you can always go and get the first two chapters for free on the website. Uh, Max Tudor, I said as a minister, I think they call him a vicar. He is a former MI5 agent. I know you're like, really so far? Like, how is this your kind of book? That's why he's a former MI5 agent turned vicar. 
Um, and then, of course, just like Jessica Fletcher, people always get murdered around him. He is always um, in charge of going and trying to help the police figure this out as if they can't do it themselves. I love it. Uh, Millette actually won the Agatha Christie Award and very deservedly, it's very Agatha. Uh, and I don't know if you know, I don't consider Agatha cozy. I did when I first started and then the more I read cozies and I looked into like what makes it, what makes a book a cozy, she's not cozy. Neither is GM Millette. Mallier, I don't know how you say it. I should look that up. But definitely has Agatha plot lines. Agatha um, characteristics, the vocabulary is there. You know, that's one of the things that I love. Subtle humor, I need humor. Doesn't have to be like laugh out loud funny, but I love smart humor. Uh, in this particular one, the Harvest Fair is the setting. It brings the villagers out and that's um, when tragedy strikes. The other thing I really like about GM Mallier, um, I like I said in the Kate Carlisle series, I am big on timing. It has to be the right time for me. If you don't do the right timing, remember in the last video when I talked to you about the knitting men, men who knit or something like that, the timing is probably the biggest thing that I like could not stand. It took way too long to get to where it needed to get to. And you didn't give me enough in the beginning to draw me in. These have a lovely setting. Everything is getting set up. I'm already interested in the people, the location before the crime ever happens. I love that. I need that kind of timing. And because I had read the second one before the first one, when I went back to this one, once Mallier starts introducing like uh, cotton, is it, what's his, um, DCI cotton, I think it is, and Edwina, like their introductions were that more sweet. So highly recommend this one. Um, and take your time to savor it. Don't rush through these. Um, you know, I say that and then I listen to the first two like to review in just a matter of a couple of days so that I could listen to Pagan Spring, which I immediately started. Um, but I have actually now read the first two twice. So I'm going to call that savory. So that takes me to the second one, which was Fatal Winter, which I have already talked to you about that one too, but just going to do a bit of a um, recap because that was February of 2022. The series, I know how it came up. This series was touted as kind of like a Knives Out series. And of course, I love Knives Out as much as Agatha Christie. Not as much, but as I love Agatha Christie. So I was like, ooh, Knives Out. I'm willing to listen to that. It is a true whodunit. All three of the books are a true whodunit. And I love those that, I love that trope. Um, and then that takes me to Pagan Spring, the one that I really wanted to read this year. So that's why I went back and listened to the first two. I really enjoyed Pagan Spring. It holds up to the first um, two. It is very worthy of an Agatha, the way that the whole thing is set up. Um, the next one, number four, is called Demon Summer. So I will be doing that this summer. While the series is definitely not a cozy series, it is definitely a cozy setting. So on this one in the review, I say, so I've already called him a minister, and then I called him a vicar. And in this one, I say Matt Tudor is a former MI5 agent turned Angel... Angel, Angelican, I think that's how you say it, priest, uh, and part-time sleuth. This one also focuses way more on um, Max Tudor and his newfound relationship, so not going to um, go and do any spoilers there, but he is very much in a relationship with someone in this particular book, and that relationship takes several twists and turns, which I absolutely love. Now, you definitely can read any of these books on their own if, like, you're watching this video and it's winter and you're like, maybe I want to start with Fatal Winter. You absolutely can. Um, there's nothing that would keep you from understanding or enjoying any particular book if you don't have the ones before it. But I just love reading series in order, so that's why I went back and did it that way. And then because it is autumn, winter, spring, summer, then it is easy to read these seasonally. So highly recommend this series. I gave a five out of five to all three of them. That takes us to our next book, and that is Agatha Christie's Cards on the Table. Looks like this. Um, if you have been following me, you know I'm a huge Agatha fan. If not, guess what? I'm a huge Agatha fan. Um, if you go up, go up one more and then one more, that up there, you can see there's an Agatha game, card game, like right there that's faced out. Um, I love Agatha. Uh, I have read her books in order with a group since, 
um, January of 2022. So we are about a year and a half in. This is the 15th Hercule Perot book. Um, I want to say it's our like, I don't know why I don't have it on here. How do I? Oh, number 27th Agatha that we're reading in chronological order. Um, it says Hercule Perot number 15. I have it down as our 14th Hercule Perot. I think, and again, once I start talking about Agatha, some of you, you probably just need to fast forward because I know nobody cares about a lot of this Agatha detail stuff, but I do. So Goodreads has this as a Hercule Perot number 15. My group has it as a number 14 Hercule Perot because we have not read Black Coffee, which is not technically an Agatha book. Um, it was an Agatha play turned into a book. So I do have it. Another one that I need to make sure I'm reading this summer, <clears throat> but technically it's not in the, um, technically for us, it's not in our numbered lineup of Hercule Perot. So throwing that out there. I enjoy this particular Agatha. Um, uh, I would say, yep, four out of five on this particular Agatha. It does center around a, um, another dinner party. We've had several dinner party murders so far. 13 at dinner comes to mind, but several others too. Um, this one brings back lots of characters that we have been gently introduced to up until this point. And like I said, this is number 27. So Colonel Race, Superintendent Battle, um, and Perel all come into this one. They are at the dinner party with some new people that I've been looking forward to meeting. Ariande Oliver, who if again, you are in the um, Agatha Christie universe, you know Agatha claims that that is um, someone that is kind of modeled after her. She is a writer. Um, <laughs> Ariande Oliver is a writer and she um, has a lot of uh, Christie's characteristics, admittedly so by Agatha. Mr. Shaitana is the main character in this, but that doesn't stay for long. Again, I don't feel like I'm giving anything away on this. Um, as you're reading along, you know he's such a weird character that, that there's a reason he's so weird. Um, he is very a very Agatha kind of character. He's mysterious. His name is um, related to Satan. Um, <clears throat> so you have to wonder, like, why is that? It has a lot of the other Christy hallmarks like poison, kleptomania, affairs, stabbing, shootings, matchmaking. We're always on the lookout for those in my group. Um, once again, we've had lots of discussions now that we're on number 27 in the Agatha universe. Um, her discussion of race, her use of language, um, and uh, one that's been coming up quite frequently is her dealing with... Um, uh, characters that might have alternative lifestyles in this one, the relationship between Anne Meredith and Rhoda Dawes, hints at Christy maybe playing with some of those alternative relationships. Um, the, ITV, the ITV adaptation is very well done. You know, I read the Agatha. Usually I then listen to it. I listen to the All About Agatha podcast. I watch the adaptations. I go in and read the Wikipedia. I have three or four Agatha reference books that I then dig into and pull things out of before we have our meeting. My next Agatha meeting is um, not until June 30th. I know that's crazy. And we haven't met for about two weeks. But summertime gets a little bit crazy. We try and stick with our Friday night meetings. And um, we just weren't able to pull one together until June 30th. So I do. we do have two Agathas on the docket for that trip. And I'll have to think about it. We'll cover that during my currently reading maybe. Um, because I haven't started either one of those. Death on the Nile, we already read, but we read it out of order. Um, but there's one before that. I can't remember what it is. So I'll have to find that one and let you know what it is that we're reading. Um, there's also a radio adaptation to this one, which I absolutely love. Thought it was very well done, as usual. This one is a little unique because it does have a forward by Agatha Christie, and we've not seen that. She explains herself a little. She explains herself a little bit to the reader. Um, one of the things I picked up early reading Agatha's that I super enjoy is how she is a little tongue in cheek about writers in general, but especially mystery writers, mystery novels. And this one has a lot of those things, probably because I can never say her name. Ariande Oliver is in here, and she is often the one making these little comments, dropping these kinds of comments. But I really enjoyed that. I thought it was very tongue in cheek. Now, 
that being said, remember, we are also tracking the racial comments of Agatha. Um, and I try to remember she is a product of her time and not to look and judge her through today's um, experiences and knowledge and progressiveness, maybe. Um, but at the same time, sometimes that's hard. And it's a little hard in this one because she is a bit heavy on those kinds of comments. Um, mainly because Mr. Shaitana too, like um, she is very heavy on trying to describe him and he is described as a foreigner and his coloring and his culture. And um, again, that's really up to you. If you are um, able to read Agatha, we are reading her for many different reasons, entertainment being the first one. But another guiding reason that I ask people to read Agatha with me in chronological order is to see the growth of a writer. Um, and we kind of thought we might be a little bit past that, and we aren't. This one was pretty heavy on that. Um, do you highly recommend this, Christy? I gave it a four out of five. The next book, oh, I'm sorry. This is the one. This is the first one that I'm like, okay, it's not a five out of five. I am glad I read it. It is called Standing in the Shadows, Bigfoot Stories from Southeastern Ohio by Doug Waller. Um, it is self-published. So once again, I feel like I've talked a little bit about self-published books. You know, anybody can write a book and self-publish it, but that still doesn't mean that I um, am not going to read it because just writing a book about anything that you find interesting, your own story or your own interests or um, your own love, you're just writing a book for the love of writing. Um, Finishing a book is a great accomplishment, and I am happy to celebrate that with you by reading. But if it is self-published, it makes me a little more leery because it didn't go through an editor that I, as a reader, am probably going to be a little more judgmental about. Um, I also have my Bigfoot uh, vinyl sticker that came from the Hocking Hills Coffee Emporium um, coffee shop. I think it's what it's called. I think it even has an N. I think you can stay there. So picked that up and picked this up in the same place. And that is also where I had a cardamom latte. I put the little sticker in here so I remember. Um, it was a cardamom spice latte and it was so good that now when I'm at a coffee shop, it's the first thing I ask. Do you have cardamom lattes? Can you make me a cardamom latte? Um, Doug Waller also signed this book. He was a local author talking about Bigfoot. I am glad I read it. Um, you know, I am a big Bigfoot fan. I've probably reviewed some other books for you. Um, oh, what was the really fun one? I can't think of it. I'll try and think of it um, and put it in the reviews. Oh, I cannot think of it. It was so good, though. It was a fiction book. It was about... Um, a small community that was isolated from the rest of the world because of, I think, a snowstorm or forest fires or something. And then Bigfoot, a family of Bigfoot came in and preyed on them. It was so good. Um, can't think of the name of it at this point. But um, I guess that's maybe more of the kind of Bigfoot story that I want as a fictional, um, fun kind of romp. This is nonfiction. It does Doug Waller talks about his experiences with um, Bigfoot and his learning about Bigfoot as he has started looking into it. And then he um, tells the stories of lots of other people who've had personal encounters with Bigfoot um, and talking about bears. So I enjoyed it. I'm super glad I read it. I would highly recommend it for those of you who like Bigfoot, especially because it takes place in southeastern Ohio. That makes it interesting to me, too. Um, I want to know like where exactly do I have the best chances of seeing an encounter with Bigfoot um, and he does have a Facebook page dwaller465 at gmail.com um, he lives in Norwich Ohio with his wife and I think it is a great feat that he sat down and wrote down what he knew about Bigfoot um, I don't have this kind of thing my experience with Bigfoot is listening to Bigfoot Terror in the Woods Sasquatch Chronicles two of my favorite podcasts I listen to all those stories. I love the storytelling aspect of Bigfoot. Um, and so I did enjoy this. Uh, it's just a little less sensational. And how can I fault anybody for telling a less sensational story? I can't. Uh, but it's a little less sensational, I think, than I really wanted. But super enjoyed it. Highly recommend it. I gave it a three out of five. It um, Especially for a self-published book, I did not see a lot of errors. I think that's another thing with reading self-published books. 
Um, if you don't go through an editor, you don't have that extra set of eyes. Um, and I really liked this and it was very well written, very well formatted, um, super good. Uh, Doug Waller does a great job of introducing himself, giving his background, why he's interested in telling these stories. Um, I like the details that are very common when you, if you know anything about Bigfoot, like the smell and the structure building and the knocks, like all of those things are things I've heard over and over and over again. And I enjoyed that background. There are some photos, some drawings, some extra ephemera like that, that really added to the book. Highly enjoyable read. The next book I do not have a copy of, and it was one of my favorites this month. It was called The Wild Girls. It's a thriller. I listened to it. Um, I did give it a four out of five. Not really sure why I didn't give it a five out of five, because I really like this one. And, you know, now um, I put the review out there on May 31st. So, you know, it's been almost two, uh, two weeks, and um, I keep recommending it to, like, everybody I know. I'm like, hey, have you read Wild Girls yet? Hey, have you listened to Wild Girls yet? I really, really like it. I love that there is a huge twist in the end. It's very twisty throughout, but especially in the end. I would liken it to like a Verity by Colleen Hoover kind of twist. If you've read that and you're like, oh, I really like that. Or The Wife Upstairs. I love those kinds of twists in the end. I am not someone who needs my stories tied up in a bow and everything figured out and spelled out for you. I don't, I don't need that. I don't mind it. Obviously, I read Cozy Mysteries, but I don't need it. And this one did not have it. If you like Ruth Ware, I think that, um, or Lucy Foley, this is definitely a good read alike for you. Um, there is a prologue in the book. And again, I listened to it. So I had to go back and listen to it again. At some point, I like, wait a minute. I feel like I had missed something. What was that chapter that started out the book? Um, and I've read several books that are like that, that after you're going through the book, there was one young adult book. I can't remember what it was called. It was like that where a group of people were going on a spring break trip um, high schoolers and they kind of told you one of the scenes before you got into the story and then afterward you're like oh I think there might have been some really important points <laughs> in that prologue so I do really like the prologue in this one now it is a bit graphic so if you um, are a light thriller person this one might not be for you for you it does get kind of gory and it's very descriptive in some of those parts I'm okay with that um, you know, I'm not one for trigger warnings, but there's some sexual assault in this one. Um, and it is dealt with appropriately for this particular thriller kind of book, but just be aware that's in there. You know, if you follow, it's one of those stories where you follow each of the girls and it's from their point of view. Um, and then they are getting picked off one by one. So it's a little traumatic because you've already heard in their voice, their story, their background. Although this book is described as a locked mystery book, it's not locked in a room. They are at a secluded um, location, though, where people are not coming and going. You don't see a big cast of characters. We also don't have all the necessary information, which is a big Ag Agatha um, rule, the detection club, which is huge in the book that I am currently listening to. Everyone in my family has killed someone. It focuses on the detection club rules. They are listed at the beginning. If you're an Agatha fan, if you've been with me, Feel like I've talked to you about the detection clues before. They were written in like 1920 something. And it's like, hey, mystery authors, if you're writing a book, here's things you can and cannot do. You can't have um, unknown twins. You have to introduce the killer earlier in the book. They can't just show up at the very end and, hey, this is the killer. You didn't have enough information for that. You can't have more than one locked passage or hidden passage. Like there are rules you have to follow. Um, so there, this one does not give you all the information and I'm okay with that. It's well done. But if you, um, want your mysteries to make sure that it has given you all the information so that you could solve it ahead of time, this one holds some stuff back. There is more than one narrator. The story moves along. It goes back and forth in time. Just letting you know. Nobody is innocent, just so you know, it's another one of those Verity stories or Gone Girl. Each of the girls has her own, um, oh, I don't know if I set it up for you. Um, it starts off that you know there's a close-knit group of girls. They used to call them the Wild Girls. And um, there was something that happened that they've now kind of been scattered and they're not as close. And they each one get an invitation to go to Africa to a safari-like resort and celebrate one of the girls' birthdays, and they each have their different reasons for going. 
Um, and all those reasons are spelled out for you eventually, but each girl is, um, they're not innocent for some particular reason. Highly recommend this. It was a great read. It's definitely a good read. Um, you know, I like to listen to a lot of my audios as I'm doing my housework, um, cooking, cleaning, laundry, dishes, those things that take up endless hours of your life are so much more enjoyable when you put an AirPod in and listen to one of these books. That's how I get through a lot of my mysteries. Um, and this one definitely had me taking a break after unloading the dishwasher and going and sitting on the porch and just listening. Like it was very, very enjoyable. Um, and then I think this is the last one I'm talking to you about. This is the 41st book that I've read this year. And it is The Case for Christ by um, Lee Strobel. Um, I've had this book for a really long time. It was published in 1998. So I've had it for a long time. Um, it's a very famous book in the religious community. Lee Strobel is a well-known author, um, but a little bit of background on him. He was an atheist prior to um, researching and writing this book, and this book did convince him that there is a case for Christ that you cannot ignore. There is actual evidence. He was, um, he was approaching this from a more scientific um, kind of place. I don't need that. That's not, it's just not what my faith is built on. I don't need you to prove anything. Um, but it was nice to hear his arguments. I really enjoyed this book. I took my time reading this. I've been reading it for a couple of months after someone that I work with um, came down with the book and said he was reading it. And I'm like, you know what? I have that book and I've never read it. I'll read it while you're reading it so we can discuss it. Um, and I am really glad that I finally picked it up and read it. I, so I used it as kind of a devotional kind of book. It means I like read a chapter a day, but not every day. So it takes me a little while to read it. Um, so I did finish this one. Um, and I think it is well worth reading if you are a believer or if you are someone who needs a little more proof before you decide if you want to believe or not. Um, he tells it in a very storytelling kind of voice, kind of documentary style. He went on this journey. He tells you who he is before he started this journey. He interviews um, experts in the field on different parts of like, what would be your questions? What are your doubts when it comes to Christ? Um, and he would go and talk to those people and they would give the evidence that they have um, that they are trying to say is evidence for Christ. Super good. Um, really enjoyed it. Uh, I gave it a four out of five and I do highly recommend it. Now it also brought up um, some um, other things for me. I didn't realize that I had actually two other books by Lee Strobel in my um, library already. The Discussing the Da Vinci Code. I have already read this one back when I read Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, which is a fictional novel. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the things I just really, really focus on. Um, I love The Da Vinci Code. A lot of people think that it is, uh, you know what, this is not going to be like a big religious talk. I promise it's not. However, it is a big part of my life. Um, and I am a big reader. So I love the Dan Brown series. I've read several in his series. Um, uh, and the Da Vinci Code is one of them. It is not the first one in the series. So if you only like know Da Vinci Code when the movie came out and then maybe you read that one, it's not the first one in the series. You have Angels and Demons, um, Inferno. Uh, there's several. Um, so not in that particular order, but when I read the book, I read it as fiction, but it is one of those books that as you are reading along, you pause and you're like, wait a minute, is that true? Like you forget you're reading fiction. So I do get it, especially in the religious community. Um, if they're like, Hey, if you're reading this and you just took it all as truth, it is not all true. I get that controversy over the book. However, it is fiction. <laughs> it is a theory, and it's not a theory that I think Dan Brown is trying to present as truth. He is presenting it for entertainment. Um, but it did that book did, I think, uh, a nice job of having people who dabble maybe more in religion or um, religious thought. Maybe they decided to look into it a little bit more because like me, as they were reading along, they would be like, the heck I've never heard that before surely that's not true or is that a real theory that people believe in it's so good I love the Dan Brown series I've read three or four of them highly recommend it um, but I did read this discussing the Da Vinci Code from a religious perspective looking at the Da Vinci Code and it covers topics like um, 
women's role in the Bible, which is a huge part of the Da Vinci Code, in case you haven't read it or watched the movies. Um, what are some valid points throughout the book or what are some things that when he brings them up, this is why this is not biblically accurate. Um, it is more of a guidebook. Um, this particular one is, by, by the way. It focuses on, I think he made like a DVD that you could go through, a DVD study for churches to go through at the time when Dan Brown was a big deal with this. Um, and so I did add a, a Goodreads review out there for that one. And then I still have this exploring the Da Vinci Code and I'm going to read this next. So I, again, summer reading, this is on my summer reading list with uh, Demon Summer. <laughs> How about that one? By Mallier, tongue in cheek, right? Uh, and then Black Coffee by Christy. That's on my summer list. Making my little summer list here as we talk. Not true. I've been working on it for months. Um, but this one is also one that needs to be done over the summer. And easy to do because it, again, is just kind of a little um, guidebook. So I will be doing that one too. Um, and that being said, again, Lee Strobel, um, who wrote the book that I'm talking to you about, The Case for Christ, and then discussing the Da Vinci Code. He had a TV series that walked you through like the Da Vinci Code type of thing too because it was so interesting at the time. Um, so I plan to look that one up. I have not seen it. It was called Faith Under Fire, I think. But if you, like me, maybe grew up in the church, I was raised Southern Baptist. I've told you this before if you've watched my videos, but if not, I was raised Southern Baptist. I'm extremely thankful and grateful for my upbringing in the church. Um, I often say I was raised by the church because I did stick with the church, um, whereas my family, uh, most of them do not attend church anymore. But when we were growing up, we went every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night for visitation. But <laughs> like, we were at the church all the time. And when I uh, was in junior high, high school, I thought the youth group was the best thing in the world, and it really was for me. Um, kept me on the straight and narrow, and I really appreciate the experience that the church gave me. However, being raised in a Southern Baptist church, often you are told how things are. Um, but I had a firm foundation in the Bible and biblical teaching, and I was a reader. So I continued to do all those Bible studies, you remember, like experiencing God and um, discipleship youth and all those things really taught me to dig into my Bible and I've continued doing that all my 50 years. So it has served me well. Um, I am very thankful for that, that firm foundation of faith. And I always enjoy reading these kinds of books and getting different perspectives on where other people are coming from. So again, love those kinds of stories. Very thankful to have read that. And that takes us to the end of the books I've read since the last time we've talked. The camera is at 56 minutes to get to this particular portion. I'll be able to cut that down quite a bit, but then we will move on. Let me check my notes. All right, looks like I do have a couple of magazines to point out to you. Um, they were sitting right here, so I don't know why I didn't think about it. But I've been catching up on my magazine reading as we've taken a couple of road trips, which is when I get to read my magazines. This is Harper's Bazaar, October 2021. It has no post-its in it though, which means I don't have anything to point out to you. So just gonna show you that one. Um, I read the May, I'm sorry, the March Vogue. Um, and again, I don't have any post-it notes on there, so no stories that I wanted to point out to you looks like. And then I also have, oh, that was the March, this was March 2023 that I showed you. And then I also had the March of 2022 that I was um, checking off before too. And it has no post-it notes, so not a great magazine um, reading there for me, but at least going to show you those. Okay, that takes us to our revisits, corrections, and updates, so give me a minute to redo the table, and I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. Yes, it's a large stack, but several of them go together, and I mean, you know what? If you are here, <laughs> and you are watching these incredibly long book chats, I'm going to believe that we are soul siblings. And so what, what did um, Anne, um, Anne of Green Gables, what did she call her best friend to use a literary reference? Bosom friends, I think. God, what was that called? I'm gonna have to look that one up. But anywho, if you are here, I'm assuming it's because you like book chatter and I am here to give you book chatter and it takes a long time 
and we have long lists and I go back and I revisit things because I am a woman of my word. And when I say, oh, I'm gonna have to look that up for you. I look it up for you <laughs> and then I do come back to it. So uh, these are some things that we need to get back to and it is summertime and the living is easy. So we're just gonna lean back and we're going, we're going to um, revisit some of those things that I've said, hey, I'll get back to you on that. Um, now that being said, one of those things I don't have a visual for, but I wore a shirt in one of my videos, I can't remember which episode, but here in the last couple of ones, that says can't be trusted in a bookstore. And um, I told you that I bought it in Little Nashville at the Educated Otter, and that I was gonna try and find the brand for you. And, and the brand on that is Literary Creations by Jenny. Can't be trusted in a bookstore. It's about $20. I'm pretty sure the um, like the tag says Canva, and I really like Canva t-shirts. I feel like that those are really soft. I love it. Um, so throwing that one out there, um, the, she does have a website, literarycreationsbyjenny.com. Obviously, by the name of her website, you know that there's going to be more than just that t-shirt on her website that you're going to want to put in your cart. Check out. All right, so that takes us to um, Sarah Dessen. Um, I have several updates on Sarah Dessen, added some good reads because I've mentioned her before and then I realized I didn't have good reads. So uh, June 6th, I added a good reads for Just Listen. This is probably my favorite Sarah Dessen. I really, really enjoy it. Um, I read this book and when I first started, I thought it's gonna be just like Speak. So why do I read this one if I've already read Speak? But number one, Speak is, has a black cover. It's very dark. It's very <clears throat> serious and dark the whole time. This is Sarah Dessen. She is not. A lot of her books come in these, um, you know, Easter egg kind of covers. <clears throat> her main characters, pretty sure, are always teenage girls dealing with something. But she does it in a much more lighthearted um, attitude. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not to say that it's a lighthearted topic. It is not. It's the same topic as speak. So if you read that, you know what that's about. This is too. Um, however, a lot more about the story comes out. The rest of the main character's um, life is talked about. Well, Annabelle is a very relatable teen. She <clears throat> has undergone some trauma that she has not been forthcoming with her family about because her family is already struggling with a sister who struggles with the anorexia and she doesn't want to add to their struggle with the struggle that she thinks she can deal with on her own. She cannot. She needs to deal with that struggle. Now, I read this back in 2007. Um, it was just like a year after it was published, and then that is one of the things that, like, then I continued as a high school librarian to always order Sarah Nesson's new book and always put it on my to-be-read list. I haven't read a bunch of them, but I've read a few. I would read anything by her, and I would recommend anything by her. Uh, so I just wanted to update you a little bit on her. <clears throat> I also have a copy of Saint Anything, which I have not read, but I'm putting that on my to be read list. The other Sarah Dessen book that I did read, and I also added a Goodreads review for back on June 6th of this year, <clears throat> I read in 2008. And honestly, I don't remember as much about this one as I do about Just Listen. Just Listen is my favorite. Um, I think because it surprised me because I was expecting a book that was just going to be like a speak, read aloud, and it was not, um, that I don't remember a whole lot about this other one, the Someone Like You. But I do remember it as a quick, girly kind of read where the main character is a teenage girl undergoing some kind of decision. Hers, I think, has to do with um, dealing with a friend who's undergoing some life changes, and she's trying to be there for the friend, and they're both walking through this um, life difficulty at the same time. She's trying to be there for her friend, and she also has a love interest. Um, her books might be a bit dated because it was written in 1998. The Someone Like You was written in 1998. So um, I do think it was probably a little bit lighter and didn't get as much acclaim as the Just Listen because it was being read by people who had read Speak and wanted a similar read. But still, I hold to the fact that I would recommend any Sarah Dessen for any teenage girl. I think that they enjoy um, realistic fiction and that her characters are relatable. I also have a copy of The Truth About Forever and I have a copy here and I have a copy in my classroom. So this is one that I do want to read um, and that way I would be able to recommend it. 
also have a copy of What Happened to Goodbye. So that's on my to be read list. Um, so Sarah Dessen, highly recommend for teenage girls or anyone, but really for teenage girls, that is definitely her target audience. They are relatable, realistic characters. I've also talked to you about Sarah Dessen's Along for the Ride because it was turned into a movie last year. And these are, um, I know several of hers have been turned into movies that I just need to watch. I've never watched before. <clears throat> The next author I would like to update you on is Sharon Draper. I've talked to you about her five or six times, um, episodes 19, 20, 27, 31, 32, 35. Um, I don't know why I've talked to you so much about her. Probably mainly because there are a couple that I want to make sure that you're aware of. She is a local author. She writes for young adults. And then her book, Out of My Mind, has been turned into a movie or is be being turned into a movie. And um, I am very much looking forward to how they are going to do that. Super good. <clears throat> so I have talked to you about some of these books before. So some of, this, some of these will be a review. But I do want to quickly review them. I've talked to you about Copper Sun. It did have a Goodreads out there. I put it out there in October 3rd of 2022. So I must have talked to you quite a bit about this one. This is historical fiction, super good, super dark. This one is set in 1738 Ghana. Big change from um, her Hazelwood High series that I highly recommend or her other more modern books. Big, big difference, but very well done. Um, the main girl is kidnapped um, out of her tribe. She has, I believe, a young brother who's also been kidnapped. She is trying to get them um, to safety. They flee to Southern Florida, a sanctuary city, again, in the 1700s, so you get lots of history on that. Um, and even though this is labeled as young adult, I would say there's quite a bit of mature reading in here, especially just those concepts of being kidnapped and sold into slavery. It's heavy. It's a very heavy topic. Very well done. Highly recommend. Um, mainly I'd say I have talked to you about, uh, Sharon Draper because Out of My Mind is being turned into a movie. Um, it is supposed to be like filmed already and is just out there, um, waiting to be released. Uh, but the main character in this one is Melody and Melody is, um, in the fifth grade, but doesn't really function as a fifth grader because she is nonverbal in a wheelchair. Um, and... Throughout the novel, she gets um, a device that helps her communicate with the world. They realize that she is a lot smarter than they thought. They move her into an area where she can um, learn at her own pace. And she joins a group, a social group at the school. And uh, those students in fifth grade are also trying to deal with how to address someone who is not like them. Great book. Highly recommend anyone, any age should read this book, fifth grader up. Another Sharon Draper book that I read was Tears of a Tiger. Am I down to? Sorry. Yeah. Tears of a Tiger. I do not have a copy of that one, but it is number one in the Hazelwood High series. Again, might be a bit dated because it was published in 1994. I read it in the early 2000s, um, but it is one that Sharon Draper is known for. Um, so, you know, people still read The Outsiders. We don't say it's dated, right? So in the Hazelwood High series would be an accurate portrayal of an inner city school in the 1990s. Um, highly recommend it. Realistic fiction. Main character is driving drunk with friends in the car. Some of them don't make it out. He is um, dealing with that survivor's guilt. Super good. That's Tears of a Tiger. Um, and I do have the second book in that series called Forged by Fire. It's a short one. I just need to read it. It's on my to be read list. And then um, another Sharon Draper book that I read and highly recommend is called Panic. Um, this is not to be confused with this Panic, which is um, uh, Lauren Oliver. So I did want to touch on that because I do want you to realize that those are two different books. Uh, but Sharon Draper's Panic is another realistic fiction and it is more of a thriller. So her books are all over the place. Historical fiction, realistic fiction in a high school, um, a fifth grader who is disabled and now this one which is realistic fiction some high school girls they're on a dance team together they go to the mall they get separated one of them is approached by someone who is able to fulfill some of the dreams that she has as a dancer she knows she shouldn't go if you watched oprah in the 1990s you know do not leave the scene ever do not allow yourself to be transported to a second location don't 
do it. Thank you, Oprah, for teaching us all. Do not let yourself be taken to a second location. This girl does. Uh, what is her name? Diamond is her fam is her name. Um, Diamond's family realizes that she is missing. Um, they don't know what's happened. They do not stop looking for her. You do hear some things from Diamond's point of view. It's not incredibly descriptive or graphic, but you can imagine what is happening to a teenage girl who has been kidnapped. So there is that, just so you know. But super good young adult realistic fiction. It's called Panic. Um, and I really uh, thought it was well done and I highly recommended it in my high school when I was a high school librarian. Um, I would still recommend it to my classroom today, but I don't have a copy of it in my classroom. And I try my best to mainly recommend the books that I can put into a student's hand. Hey, by the way, this is probably on the down low. So if you're a Blanchester person and you're listening, let me just say, I talked to Amanda Johnson, who is our um, teenage librarian. Is that what we're going to call her? Librarian for teenagers at the Blanchester Public Library. And boy, does she have something super exciting in store for Blanchester students. She's working on a grant, so that's all I'm going to say for now. But I had never heard of this concept before. Um, if you are in Blanchester, you know I was the high school librarian for 20 years. It was my legacy that was then eliminated. Um, it is super, super upsetting. And as a high school teacher, I was put back in the classroom teaching English. As a high school teacher, it is an abomination that we have a library filled with books that we don't have any system for getting into the hands of students. So as a high school English teacher, when I want my kids to read something, I have to lead them to Libby, um, the online, reading books online through the public library, or trying to get them to go visit our public library for their access to books. And Amanda's working on something and I am so excited. I can't wait to share that with you once it all transpires and I hope it does. So if you're a praying person, put Blanchester students on your prayer request list um, and lift them up so that they might have better access to books, any book that they want to read. Um, and that would be through the public library. And I mean physical books. Libby is a wonderful thing. I can't tell you what an advantage that is for my students in a lower, um, you know, economic, socioeconomic area to have that kind of access to any book they want to read through Libby online. But a physical book, obviously, I think there's something to be said about that. I am often taking a book and putting it in a kid's hands from my personal collection um, or wherever I can borrow a copy of a book from. But i um, super excited about this new opportunity, and I will keep you posted on that. I'm just telling you, I had never heard of this concept before, and I was so interested in how she was going to make this work. So there's that. Um, I also had talked to you about Sharon Draper's book, Blended. I picked up a copy, Thrift, but I put it in the classroom. I have not read that, and I don't have a copy to show you, but it's on my to-be-read list. Oh, so I don't want you to confuse Sharon Draper's Panic with Lauren Oliver's Panic. I have not read this. I have read Sharon Draper's. I have not read this. I love Lauren Oliver though, so this is on my to-be-read list. Man, I just, I need to get to it. I really like Lauren Oliver, so this is on my to-be-read list. Now, we've talked about Lauren Oliver many times before um, because she is one of those um, authors that I highly recommend. Before I Fall, um, Vanishing Girls, Delirium, and there's also, this is a series on Netflix, supposedly. So I need to be looking that up, summer list. Uh, I need to be looking up that series on Netflix and then I do want to read it and watch it. All right, my refill was orange juice. I feel a little puny this morning. I'm sure it's just from being gone all day yesterday, walking so much, eating so much, drinking so many different things. Um, but yeah, a little bit puny. Oh, the uh, next book, I'm going to have to move these so that it doesn't like cover up my face, right? The next book that I want to just re-mention is Find Her by Lisa Gardner. I have already talked to you about this. I read it. I had a Goodreads out there, um, but I, am, uh, pick, I picked up a thrifted copy not too long ago, and I'm adding it to my classroom. So just wanted to re-mention it to you real quick. Lisa Gardner's Find Her. Um, it is number nine in a series, the Detective D.D. Warren series. I put the review out there on Goodreads in May 4th of 2020. So it's been a while since I've talked to you about her. Um, but I picked it up in a thrifted haul, so I just kind of wanted to revisit. 
Someone at work gave me a copy of the book well, the first time when I had read it, and they're like, oh, this seems like something I think that you would really like. And I did. I loved it. It was a very quick thriller. It's very light, um, but it's a psychological thriller, and those are the ones I kind of go for, which is what I would say Wild Girls is. Um, the main character is in Jeopardy most of the book, um, and I think that's probably what really makes you want to finish the book and read it so quickly. There's a little blurb on here by Karen Slaughter, who I've not read, but she writes some of the series that I watch, like um, Will Trent, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So she's someone that I do want to read. Uh, the main character suffers a trauma, like when she's in college, and she uses that trauma as uh, to propel her into the particular situation that she's in where she works with other survivors in the FBI. Um, and it's thriller because the main character puts herself back in harm's way. And so you know this is not going to end well. Like she has, she should not have done this. Um, and you need to know like how she going to get herself out of this situation. Um, super good. Deals with kidnapping. Like I said, there is trauma. You know she's endured some trauma at the beginning like in her past. And that is pretty descriptive. But if you like thrillers and you've not read Lisa Garner, she's a good one. The next one I want to revisit and mention to you is um, Meyer. What's her first name? Marissa Meyer. It's the Lunar Chronicles. That's not even a cover to show you. Lunar Chronicles Sender. It's the first one in the Sender series. It doesn't really help you to do that. How about if I do it like this? Then you can see that's better, right? Um, I read this a long time ago. I put the Goodreads out April 19th of 2016, a few years ago. Um, I have talked to you about her on Goodreads. I mean, I've talked to you about her on YouTube before. I'm not really sure why, but I think I just hadn't uh, printed out the Goodread and given it an accurate book chat, so I want to do that. And I think maybe that is because I book hauled this just here recently. I don't have a copy in my room yet, but it is one that I have recommended to students before. Um, I had read the book in 2016 because working in a high school library, Marissa Meyer's name came up over and over again, and so did Lunar Chronicles. It's not really my preferred genre, but I really enjoyed it when I read it. It's a page turner. It makes me want to read more of the series. Um, I remember like staying up past my bedtime on school nights to read this book because I'm like, where is this going? How is that going to come back? Because I feel like that's going to come back. Uh, you do need to know that this is a retelling of Cinderella. Cinder, Cinderella. It is a retelling. It is written in an alternative future. There is some science fiction in there, maybe some fantasy, if you want to call it that. So it does not follow all of the current re, uh, rules in our particular world, um, but it's believable. And you can tell when you read this book that it is leading you into something else. So Marissa Meyer, this particular The Lunar Chronicles, um, it does continue to tell other stories that are retellings of fairy tales. Um, so if you do read Cinder and you like it, there's, there are many more to follow. Um, I do highly recommend this series, The Lunar Chronicles. It is a YA series, kind of science fiction, kind of fantasy. Now, I'm not really sure how this came up, but I feel like the last book chat, um, Moby Dick came up. And maybe it was because when it came up, I'm like, how do I not have that in my document in my book chats? Like, have I not talked to you about Moby Dick? It is one of my favorite books. Um, so I have this. It's Moby Dick in Pictures. It is by Matt Kish. It says one drawing for every page. I met Matt Kish at Cincinnati's Books by the Banks a um, long time ago. I think I've got the year around here for you somewhere. But what he did is he took... Um, he was reading Moby Dick, which I also have read and highly recommend. Um, but I also recommend Matt Kish's book, Moby Dick in Pictures. But every page that he read for Moby Dick, he, he drew something. So that is the premise of this book. It is beautiful. There's a lot of, um, you know, what do you call it? Abstract. There are a lot of abstract drawings and then there are a lot that are not. Like you can tell where they come from. So, went to Books by the Banks. Let's see, if does it tell you when? I think it was in 2011. Went to Books by the Banks, met this author, saw that he did this particular, um, what do you want to call that? I know I've talked about this before, but like a reading project, a drawing project, um, and super interested me. So, I bought his book. I, once again, do I have a history of doing this? Yes, I do. 
I drug people with me. I said, hey, guys, I've never read Moby Dick before. I am a, you know, I have an English degree. I'm a teacher. I'm a librarian. Let's read Moby Dick together. I'm like, yeah, okay, uh, because I have great friends. So did get a group of people to read it with me. I want to say there were maybe five or six of us. There weren't a lot. Um, but we said, okay, you're going to read the first hundred pages and then we're going to have a meeting. We read the second hundred pages. Let's have a meeting. And I would say that's probably what we did was about a hundred pages. Um, because we met five or six times over the course of a year, year and a half, maybe. Um, and we would discuss the book. We would look at Moby Dick and Picture by Matt Kish. I don't think we all had a copy of the Matt Kish book, as I recall. So I remember bringing it to the meetings and, you know, people looking through it. Um, when we came to the meetings, another extremely satisfying book project. So that's probably would be a good breakout video too. I love to come up with these ideas that take me forever to come to fruition. But um, that, that was another reading project that I did um, that was very gratifying. Uh, you know what, just meeting with people. I love having a group of people that are doing something like-minded. It doesn't have to be reading. Yours might be making a quilt. I've done that too. Um, but it might just be something else that has to do with your interests. But the chemistry of getting a like-minded group of people together to discuss something or work on something just is very gratifying to me. And this was one of those projects. And the added bonus was, I can't believe how much I love Moby Dick. It is now one of my favorite books. Um, you know, it's one of those books that people often talk about that, that it's a classic they've never read. Read it. <laughs> um, it's funny. It is endearing. It is so well written. I know, like, I have something to say about Herman Melville's writing. But it it's so readable, and I think I just didn't expect that because I'm not a big classic reader. I've read some. Um, but I'm not a, you know, diehard English fan when it comes to reading classics. And Moby Dick is one of my favorite ones. I love it. I love the characters. I love the main character. I love Moby Dick. I love um, Queequod. <laughs> is that his name? I just, I have fond, fond memories of reading this book with a group of people and going over Matt Kish's book as well as Herman Melville's. Uh, Matt Kish started those drawings like on a blog back when blogs were, you know, 2011, or I think he probably started his blog in like 20, uh, 2009 or something like that. And then it turned into a book deal. Now, when I'm talking a book deal, I don't mean self-published on this one. I mean, somebody saw his blog and said, Hey, we want to publish this. It's published by 10 house books in Portland, Oregon. And I mean, yes, this is a hefty, massive book. Um, it says it was $39.95. It's, it's under the genre of art and literature. It is. It is so worth it. it it's so worth it. It's so lovely. Um, but he did have a blog. And then, of course, his friends were like, you know what? You should pursue this. Like, he got a better, you know, more and more of a following until it turned into a book deal. Um, so many of us dream of having that kind of success <laughs> um, or experience. So I did just add the reviews for uh, Moby Dick and Moby Dick in Pictures on Goodreads because I had not reviewed those before, but I read them back in 2011. I also um, had listened to parts of Moby Dick um, Big Read, um, if, and I think it's still available, but it's another way to experience Moby Dick. I do plan on listening to the whole thing, and that was a project where... Famous people um, signed on to read a different chapter in Moby Dick, and that would be a great way to experience it too. Um, and I would like to do that. That would be a good one for my summer list. Uh, that being said, I also saw that I had read Billy Budd by Herman Melville. Now, do notice that um, Herman Melville's Billy Budd says Billy Budd in other tales. So it is a short story, and I only did Billy Budd. Um, so I need to read the other Billy, the other Herman Melville short stories. But um, when I was researching this, I'm like, hmm, remind me, because I read Billy Budd back in 1997 and didn't have a review out there for it. I remember that I actually listened to the audio on cassette tapes. I'm a 51-year-old woman from the Midwest. Um, and that is how I used to listen to my audiobooks. I remember back when I started teaching in 1994 in Southern Kentucky, uh, that I would, I don't know why, but I, when I was growing up and when I went to college, public library, I don't know. It didn't occur to me to go that route. But if you stopped at the Cracker Barrel on 75 in Corbin, 
Um, you could rent books for like $4.99. You had to pay for the book, like the audio book was like $24.99 plus, um, you know, pay like $4.99 to rent it or whatever. And then you got it for like two weeks or whatever. And it was on cassette tapes and I would listen to those cassette tapes on my way to work and back. Um, and my commute was like 40 minutes through Corbin. And then you would drop it off and they would refund you the cost of the book minus the rental fee. Um, this sounds archaic now that I'm saying it out loud, but I listened to a lot of books that way back in 1994 um, through 96 when I worked in, um, you know, a very rural school out in Southern Kentucky. Um, and I don't know, I think I ended up when we moved back to Ohio in 1996, my grandmother was very ill and I came home to kind of help take care of her and we knew it was her last days. It wasn't like we were nursing her back to health. We knew it was her last days. I wanted to spend them with her. We moved back to Ohio. Um, and that's when I joined a book club. I read Barbara King Solver's The Bean Trees at that book club. I don't know, book club, probably through Oprah. I'm not gonna lie. I, you know, I had read books through um, Oprah's book club. So that's probably who told me to join a book club. And then I got interested in the public library. And then I was like, oh my gosh, why doesn't everybody do this? Why are we paying for books? Why are we uh, paying for Audible, you know, whenever we can get these for free? Uh, but it has taken me a long time to get to that. And I think it was just kind of an evolution. But I know that I listened to, to um, Billy Bud on audio cassette tape. And I'm pretty sure that I own those cassette tapes and maybe still do. So I'm going to need to look for those. They're probably in my library for the last 20 years um, at the school. But I don't remember in 1997 loving Billy Bud like I loved Moby Dick. And that might be why it took me so long then to read Moby Dick is that I thought, yeah, I'm not a big classic reader. Um, but uh, Billy Budd is more of a classical short story where the main character is in peril. Um, I think he's being wrongfully accused if I'm not mistaken. So just didn't hit me as much as Moby Dick. But I read it, put the review out there in Goodreads for you um, to try and catch that up. And then I would say on my to be read list, Matt Kish, who did Moby Dick in Pictures, I had also at the same time purchased this Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad um, in both Moby Dick and in this one. When I was talking to him and purchasing the books, he drew a little thing on the um, title page. So this is on my to be read list. I need to read Heart of Darkness. I have read it before, um, Conrad. Um, Joseph Conrad. I do not have a good reads out there for that, so I do need to add that, um, and I will do that for you, but I really didn't want to. I started to just go ahead and do it, and then I'm like, I don't remember that much about Heart of Darkness. I need to reread it with the um, Matt Kish one where it's illustrated. I need to do it this way to remind myself about the story, and then I will add a good read. So that's on my to-do to -do list, um, but did want to show it to you because Matt Kish's books are beautiful. And then I have three nonfiction ones to add to you, and then we'll move to the next section. But Anderson Cooper, I think I picked this up in a book haul not too long ago and talked to you a little bit about it, but um, I did not have the Goodreads printed at that time, so I went back and printed the Goodreads. Anderson Cooper, Dispatches from the Edge, A Memoir of War, Disasters, and Survivals. I love this book. This is so good. It is such a good read. Nonfiction. I put the Goodreads review out there August 30th of 2019. Okay, sorry. I had to go put a t-shirt on. I had on that long sleeve shirt and it was a little thick. I'm like, oh my goodness, I might pass out. Also going to lick Stella out real quick. All right. So, and so I did put on the t-shirt I was talking to you about at the beginning of the video from the Educated Otter uh, Literary Creations by Jenny. Can't be trusted in a bookstore, which is true. Um, hey, I say that and I visited a bookstore yesterday. It was lovely. I did not purchase a book. Technically, I don't really need one, so unless I'm getting a good deal, I'm trying not to just continuously add. I'm trying to make sure I read some of what I have, uh, but if it's thrifted, I can't be held accountable. I did buy two used books in a coffee shop yesterday, uh, but they were super cheap. How could I not? Anywho, uh, talking to you about um, Anderson Cooper's Dispatches from the Edge, a memoir of war, disasters, and survival. Pretty sure I picked it up in a book haul not too long ago here. Um, Anderson is telling stories of his journey in journalism and it focuses around Katrina um, and how we dealt with Katrina in America when this man has dealt from war with wars in other countries and we are very critical with how other countries handle their disasters 
and how terrible we handle Katrina. I think this is a recommended read for everyone, especially every American. We're very judgy. Um, and this one, let's see, it's got the tsunami, um, Iraq, Niger, and then Katrina. So he does start us in those other countries. And again, with our judgment and how we think people should have handled something. Um, and then we deal with Katrina and how we handled that. Um, it is so good, such a good read. Highly recommend Anderson Cooper's Dispatches from the Edge. Um, I reviewed it back in 2019. I would say that's probably when I actually read it also. Sure, it was one of these, um, oh, it was probably in uh, the last couple of videos I did a book haul and I had a copy of All I Ever Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten and I had reviewed that one for you. I had a copy of It Was on Fire When It Laid Down on it. There is an inscription on the front cover from my best friend, one of my best friends in college, Lisa Farish, who gave me the book on my birthday in 1992. Um, and it says, here's another book to add to your library. I hope you enjoy it. You will be such a special teacher. So stay encouraged, she said, uh, Joshua 1.9. Uh, and I did, I love this book. It was on fire when I laid down on it by Robert Fulgham. I love his All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Um, I use it every year in my classroom, and this is just an additional read by him. I, so I added a review because I didn't have one out there for that on Goodreads. And then I also read a book by him called True Love, um, and I didn't have a review out there for that, so I wanted to update you on that. Now, True Love, um, I listened to that one again on cassette tape, I think, uh, back in 1997. And I like his other books, so I think that's probably why I picked up True Love. And Robert Fulgham is a storyteller. His book of essays, All I Ever Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, are so readable. This one is more humorous. Um, the lead story on this one, someone was being interviewed about how they um, laid down on a burning bed. And, and they were like, why would you do that? And they're like, I don't know, it was on fire when I laid down on it. And then he goes on to like tell you the story around the story. Um, and in True Love, he talks about the theme of love. He tells other people's love stories love stories that he has of his own. So I would recommend anything that he writes. Anytime I see a book by him, I pick it up and then hand it to someone or uh, again, put it in my classroom. I know I have a copy of All I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten in my classroom. I don't have a copy of this one in there or True Love. I don't have a copy of True Love either, but wanted to update you on him because I highly recommend him. Now, last days in the classroom, last time I was videoing this, it was, you know, last, last weeks of class. Um, and I used this the last couple of days of class. It is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Randy Pouch, The Last Lecture. Um, this was a book that made its rounds, hmm, 2008, somewhere around 2007, 2008. Um, Randy Pouch was a professor at Carnegie Mellon. He had been suffering through um, cancer, pancreatic cancer for a year when he received the diagnosis that it had metastasized. Um, and was gonna be terminal. Like they couldn't do anything else. Like he wasn't gonna win this battle. And he um, made a lecture, which you are allowed to do um, a lot of times when you retire, but they knew that he was not gonna get that opportunity. So Carnegie Mellon let him do his last lecture there. It was taped, um, it was broadcast. A journalist was there and he approached Pouch and said, this is phenomenal. You need to put it in a book form. Um, and he did. Now, watch the video. Um, I, it's under two hours. It is phenomenal. You hear from his voice. It is amazing. Um, but then you will also want to get a copy of the book. I have a copy here. So this is one that's going in the classroom. Um, you know, there are, <laughs> there are very few moments. But there are moments um, in the classroom that are gratifying, and this was one of them. I showed the video. Um, we did an activity with it called a one pager where you just take some notes. You can draw them, you can write them, but on one page, you know, put some graphics in there, tell us like main points, that sort of thing. Um, and it was good. It was a really good um, exercise, like last week of school. Uh, several of my kids did a phenomenal job. A lot of them did a passable job. Um, but then afterward, because I only showed them parts of the video, we didn't get to watch the whole thing. Uh, I had a student come up and say, can you, where's the link to that video? Cause I really want to watch the rest of that. And he was a student. I love him. Like he's a great freshman boy, you know, 
very general student, um, but not usually interested in a whole lot of what I have to say. Like he does the work, he's very polite, don't get me wrong, but not someone who's super motivated to take the next step on their own. And he wanted to watch that video and I was just like, you're, you're the reason. <laughs> you're the reason, I show the video, I present the book, it's just so touching and it's great and it's inspirational and I want you to be inspired. And he was, it was so gratifying. So highly recommend Randy Powell and I needed to add the Goodreads, which I did. All right, that takes us through our revisits. I would um, also just like to say, and I'm just throwing it out there, I don't have a lot of information, but a couple of the authors that I previously mentioned to you have new books out. S.A. Cosby, who wrote Razor Blade Tears, which was one of my five out of five reads. Um, last year has a new book. Allie Hazelwood, who I enjoy, um, she has a new book out. I think she's going to be one of those authors that has a, a new book out every six months. Um, Riley Sager, thriller author, author who I love, um, has a new book out. Pretty sure that one's already out. I just haven't read it yet. And then Lisa C., who I'm pretty sure I've talked to you about. I know she's someone that I keep my eye on. Um, she has a new book out. So lots of recommendations there. Hopefully you added to your to-be-read list. Um, that takes us to the next section, which is our bookish haul. I, of course, have a nice stack for you. And in that haul, I have several that I've already read. So I'll give you some um, recommendations on those. And then um, there are some that are my to-be-read list. So I'm going to throw those out there. So give me a minute to make the changes, and then I'll get right back to you. All right, book haul, one stack. It's not terrible, right? Okay, it's not quite one stack. I don't have all of them up there. There might be another one hiding back here, but it's close. It's close. It's not terrible. I'm going to do a little better, but you know, especially when I'm out and about and thrifting, I can't pass up a good deal for my classroom or for my shelves or to pass on when it's just a great book that needs to be in someone's hands that I know. So that's where we are. Um, so on the book hauls, remember I'm an equal opportunity book hauler. Most of my books are thrifted, but not always. I don't think I purchased any in an actual bookstore this time around. I think all of mine came from garage sales, yard sales, or um, thrifting, pretty sure. And I even have one or two that I'm like, I don't even know where this came from, but I don't see that I've covered it in my book chats and I know I've picked it up in the last year or so, so I'm gonna show it to you. Um, if it's one that I've read and I have a Goodreads, I will share it with you. If it is one that I have read, but I don't have a Goodreads, it will go in another stack. That's what you see over here are stacks that need to be cleaned up with Goodreads. Um, and I will do that and get back with you. That's where we have our revisits and corrections. So with that being said, here are some books that I um, picked up in my recent book hauls. I picked up another copy of A Child Called It. I don't like this book. I don't. I don't want to read it. I don't. But my students either have read the book or they all are like, oh, I read that, I really like that. What? And then I tell them, you know, it's a series. He has another one called The Lost Boy and they will pick it up and read it and a man named Dave and so on and so forth. So I am going to just continuously put those copies in my um, classroom library because they are high interest and um, I have read it. I know that it is a book that is a story worth telling, worth listening to, worth reading and that they will read it. I just don't particularly care for reading it. Um, but got another copy for my library, so I mean for my classroom, so I have that. Um, it is the same version as the one that I have here on my own shelf. I also have on my to be rest, read list The Lost Boy, which I have not done, but I would like to see if his um, writing progresses and if his storytelling progresses. So I have this on my to be read list. Pretty sure that one came from a garage sale. And I need to add a good reads to that, so we'll be revisiting that here in the next little bit. I picked up another copy of Bleachers by John Grisham. Um, that means that I have one here and I will have one in the classroom now. I love this book. It's one of my favorite Grishams. It varies from his usual trope of a lawyer story, courtroom drama. This one is not. Um, it might actually even be my favorite Grisham. And I've read lots of Grishams. He's another author that I would like to get back to. Um, but I've read a lot of his books. Um, I like to read the opening of this during the fall, during football season in my classes, during a first chapter Friday, because it's a very descriptive, lovely book, especially at the beginning. It's a great seasonal read. I put the Goodreads out there for this on June 13th of 2021. I know I read it before that. 
Um, I read it in November of 2003, actually, um, but I just had not had um, a Goodreads out there, so I added one for you then. Um, the main character is Neil Grinshaw. He is coming back to his hometown after probably 10 or 15 years, I would say. Um, and they, um, all of the football, high school football players that played for a particular coach is coming back to sit visual, be, visual, visual, what's that word? I don't know, can't think of it. You know what I'm talking about though. Uh, they are going to sit and they know they're waiting for him to die. They need to be there for the funeral. Um, he is in his last days. They continuously gather in the bleachers at the high school football field in the evenings while they are waiting for this to happen and they are telling stories. And something happened in the high school locker room during halftime of a championship game and it did not end well, but it has been kept a secret and now everyone's kind of dealing with it. Super good. Um, I love the football setting. I love the football storytelling. My husband played high school football. Um, and when he is around people who uh, played those games with him, he always has things to say. Everyone remembers. Do you remember that night we played Massey and blah, 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 and the score was blah, 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 at blah, 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 and so-and-so did blah, 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 blah. It's crazy how these guys remember their high school um, sports playing days, not just football. There are lots of baseball, basketball. I've heard all of these stories. Um, but I think it lends itself to that particular kind of read. And this is one I can easily recommend. A lot of times my um, high school boys want sports novels and admittedly, I don't read a lot of that, but this is one that I've read and I highly recommend. Um, and that is John Grisham's Bleachers. I uh, will be adding one to my classroom library. I picked up a copy of the Phantom Tollbooth. Now it's a super cheap paper book back copy, picked it up at a yard sale, pretty sure. Um, our 29th, maybe, is that right? I think it's 29th. Um, wedding anniversary was this month and we went on a short trip to a wedding and uh, it was in Kentucky, mm, western-ish Kentucky, southern-ish Kentucky. Anywho, um, the uh, State Route 68 has like a long yard sale that's like 300 miles or something through several states. And we just have to happen to be staying somewhere close to that. And so we just hit a couple of yard sales while we were down there. Pretty sure that's where I picked this one up. Now, I do know the Phantom Toll Booth by Norton Jester is a, I think I saw a reading list. Yeah, a reading level 6.3. Um, it was published in 1960, I believe. And I've never read it, but it is a classic. And I want to say it even is an award winner. So I will be looking that up, putting it on my to be read list. I picked up another copy of Tribulation Force. This is part of the Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins series. I've read the first three in the series. Um, what's it called? Left Behind, Tribulation Force, and Nikolai are the three that I've read. I do already have a copy of this. I think I might even have a copy in the classroom, but again, it was at a garage sale and super cheap, so I picked up another copy to toss in the classroom. Um, I have talked to you about that series before, and it's another one that I need to get back to. I want to read the whole series. I've watched the adaptations. They are not great, but the book series is very good. That particular series follows the end days, the last times, the last times, the end days, the, yeah, the last days. I don't know. Um, another one that I picked up a copy of is Hatchet by Gary Paulson. It's not a good copy. It's a thrifted copy. But um, I have a copy in the classroom. I have a copy here. Um, so just gonna kind of trade those out to put a better copy on my shelves. Um, but God, I don't know. Um, I feel like this is a book that I could buy numerous, numerous copies because I always have multiple people asking for it. Now, a lot of my kids have already read it by the time they come to high school, but if they are someone who doesn't read it a lot, they are a freshman boy, they are interested in hunting and fishing, etc. And they've not read this this is one that i'm like hey you know i can't believe you've not read this before you really should try it or if they had someone reading it to them in the lower grades i'm like now's a good time if you've never finished a book before pick it up you're familiar with it it's very readable very high interest it's an easy read now i don't see a reading level on this but i'm gonna guess with um this it's probably about sixth grade reading level which is fine. I have a lot of kids that are not um, reading on level, which is fine for me. And my particular um, class, 
I just want you to read a book you enjoy, <laughs> period. Let's start there. I have a lot of kids that are not there. I have a lot of kids that are way beyond there. So we start there and then go from that. But did pick up a copy of that, thrifted it, and um, I think this is another one that goes in the classroom. Pretty sure I already have one on my shelf here. And then I have several in the classroom. I talked about um, Lauren Oliver a little earlier in the video when I said Panic is one that's on my to be read list and has a Netflix series. Um, not to be confused with Sharon Draper's Panic, but I also picked up another copy of Before I Fall that will go into the classroom. It's nice because it's this, um, um, you know, uh, the series before a movie. Is it a movie or a series? It's a movie. Um, it's that cover, so that's a nice one to put in the classroom because some of the students will recognize it from that rather than this. But I really like Before I Fall. I have a copy here. I think I have a copy in the classroom, so this will just add to that. But I really, really like her. Um, and I uh, will pick up a copy of that every time I see it because it's an easy one to recommend. I do have a Goodreads review out there from um, April 16th of 2021. And then I've also reviewed for you Lauren Oliver's Delirium, which I put out there in June 16th of 2021. And then Vanishing Girls, which I may not have talked to you about, but that review is out there from March 16th of 2027. That one is super good. Now, Lauren Oliver is another one of those authors who can write books and they will be on different topics and they're not related, but they are all equally good. Vanishing Girls um, is, I would say popular with people who like a book like We Were Liars, psychological thriller. It is pretty much realistic teen story, um, but definitely has a lot of psychological thriller in it. Lauren Oliver never fails to have a page turner before I fall. Any of her books are like that. I love her as an author. I would read anything that she has written. Um, and I highly recommend Vanishing Girls also. And Delirium, but I've already talked about Delirium too. Remember, Delirium is the one where it's kind of speculative fiction. Um, they have a shot that will inoculate you against love because love just causes delirium and problems. So why would we put ourselves through that in the future? And of course, some people are not buying it and they don't want to take the shot. Tiffa Gary Paulson, I know I've talked to you about Winter Dance, um, Transall Saga, um, I still need to read The River and the Rifle, which are two books that I own that are part of the Hatchet series. Um, Transall Saga, I'm not sure if I have a Goodreads out there for that. I'll have to look, and if not, I'll update you on that. I picked up another copy of The Hate You Give. This is also another one that I just continuously want to put in the classroom because it's easy to recommend. The students usually recognize it because it was a series or a movie, one or the other, that again, I have not watched, so on my summer watch list. Uh, but picked up another copy of that, and I do have a copy of that on my shelf, so that's an easy one um, to put into the classroom. I reviewed that back in 2017. I know I've talked to you about it multiple times. <coughs> Excuse me. I also then read Concrete Rose, which is a precursor to The Hate You Give. I did that in April 23rd um, of 2021. I'm sure I reviewed The Hate You Give whenever I did that one too. Um, but just in case, because I do have a note that I don't think I talked to you that much about The Hate You Give. Um, the main character is 16 year old Star Carter. She is at a party that she shouldn't be at. She reconnects with a childhood friend. Um, the party is raided, they take off. Um, she gets into the car with her uh, you know, friend from childhood, and they are pulled over by the police, and it does not end well for them. They are black teenagers um, during a time when they are very distrustful of the police, and for good reason, things do not go well, um, and she is now stuck in the center of this um, situation where a young black man has been shot by the police, and he is unarmed, um, and she is the witness. She, her dad runs the local, I think it's a grocery store in their very bad neighborhood. Her mom um, is a very accomplished black woman, career woman, and they send their kids to a private school outside of the neighborhood. They already get a lot of flack for that. Um, but wow, it is a powerful, powerful story. I remember my friend Stephanie, co-teacher, um, she was like, hey, you need to read this book. And I'm like, I don't want to read this book. I'm I, I don't want to watch it in the news. I surely don't want to read it in my free time. It's too heavy. It's too dark. I can't handle it. Read the book. <laughs> like we need to read this book. It's told from a different perspective. I like books that make me think, that make me challenge what I think. 
make me challenge how I'm looking at something, that there are other ways to look at things. Um, and not only other ways to look at things, because I don't want to say that, that makes it sound like I was like blah about the whole situation. The situation is just so heavy. And in my day-to-day -day job, my job is so heavy, it is hard for me to come home and continuously deal with heavy things. It's just, it's painful um, and it's stressful and I need to limit the amount of stress in my life. And a lot of times that means I do not want to watch the news. Um, I don't see a lot of hope sometimes in my job. So I don't want to deal with stories where I feel like we don't have that much hope. Like humanity is terrible. Um, we're not getting better. We're not dealing with things. People are ignorant and rude and mean. <laughs> and so I just, sometimes I just need another side of that and I just can't handle that kind of story, but it is important. I know it's important. I should be reading other perspectives. So I'm always glad when someone convinces me to read a book like The Hate You Give and um, I am able to view those other perspectives and that they transform um, some of my uh, passions about it. That makes me a more passionate person um, for sure. Compassionate and empathetic for sure. Love it. Highly recommend it. Then this, Jasmine Ward, Jasmine Ward, Sing Unburied Sing. I have read this. I have book talked it. Um, but I picked up another copy. I had a copy here. So this one will go in the classroom. I put the review out there for this one in April 27th of 2020, which I'm pretty sure is when I actually read it. Um, Jasmine Ward is a two-time National Book Award winner. Sing Unburied Sing is her second winner. It um, also won the New York Times Book Review 10 Best Books in 2017. It is a journal of a family um, struggling to survive. There's a young boy, 13. He's taking care of himself um, and his younger sister with the help of many other struggles. Like, it's terrible. Um, but it is told in his voice, his mother, Leone, um, who is trying. She's just unequipped to deal with life. Um, and there's a ghost. It's not a ghost story, and yet it is. It's very much realistic fiction, um, but they are going to pick up JoJo's dad, who's been in prison a number of years, and it's not a good journey. It's not a good journey. Um, they encounter a lot of dangerous people, situations. Um, JoJo is trying to get he and his sister back to safety, um, and there are a lot of battles going on. It's a very dark book. This is one where Stephanie told me to read it and I'm like, that sounds depressing. Oh, it's depressing. All right. Um, but it is a great piece of literary fiction that I'm very glad I read. And I'll be putting a copy in the classroom for my more serious readers. All right. Now here's that little stack that um, I need to bring out there. And that would be, um, these are two, my, my to be read list. Um, the Silent Wife, this is by A.S.A. A. Harrison. It says, soon to be a major motion picture. So I know I had heard about it and it was a thriller. It was in a little library, I believe the Fayetteville one up here by the police station. Um, so I always have a bag of books in my car and take and swap them out to give them, you know, a little bit more um, turnover there. And I picked that one up and put something in. I don't remember what I put in. My friend, Andrea Harpin, who I teach with, but also a friend, uh, we went to a dinner with some other Blanchester teachers and former teachers, and she said, I have a gift for you, and it was this, Something You Can Count On, The Rosary of the Seven Sorrows of Mary um, by Carl Brown. Um, Andrea is a devout Catholic. I am not. However, my future daughter-in-law is a Catholic, um, or was raised Catholic, I should say, and she and my son still attend services. They, they attend... Um, kind of a church like we do where there's not a denomination, um, but they attend that kind of a church. But I know she was raised Catholic. I know her family is very Catholic. And my friend Andrea is like, I think that you would benefit from getting this kind of background on the seven sorrows of Mary. So this is on my short to be read list. I need to do that this summer. And then um, early in the summer, was it summer already? I don't know if it was summer. I think, it, I feel like it was. No, it couldn't have been because we've been incredibly busy um, at the summer here. So we've not had any downtime. So I guess it was maybe the weekend before school was out, maybe. 
Um, my husband, oh, it was because I had a craft day that Sunday and I needed craft supplies and we had something like every day going on. And he said, if you can wait until Saturday, we'll run and get it. Um, and then I was like, oh my gosh, but then I have to come home, figure out the craft. And then we had a wedding that evening and then the craft day was the next door. That's cutting in a little close, but he was like, we'll be fine. Um, so I'm like, okay. And then he's like, we'll go to a coffee shop. I'll find you a coffee shop. I'm like, okay. Well, he did. Um, Roebling Bridge, uh, Roebling Point, sorry, coffee shop. Um, I had been to one location, maybe their original location. They've since opened two more locations. Um, and he sent us to the one in Dayton, Kentucky. And in it, they had a bookstore um, and all of these. All of these, Agatha's. I have Mr. Parker Pine Detective, which I have already read. Witness for the Prosecution, which is coming up. We've read the short story. The Big Four, which we have already read. The Tuesday Club Murders, which we have already read. There's another copy of Mr. Parker Pine Detective, but it's different than the other one. And I can't help myself. Um, we have another copy of Witness for the Prosecution. <coughs> Ta-da. So that one I'm able to pass on. And then The Labors of Hercules, which we have not read yet. So that is a great ad at the hall. I'm telling you, it's another one of those things where I had no idea when we started this journey how hard it would be to find secondhand Agathas because I am not someone who wants to go pay full price for a book, yet I need my Agathas in print when we're, calling, when we're discussing them. Um, but they are super hard to find. People either don't let them go or these are very cheap paperbacks. They probably didn't hold up if people were passing them around. Um, but they're lovely. And look, in this stack, almost all of these are the blue edge papers. I, I just love it. I love so many aspects of this Agatha Christie um, reading project. But picked those up, and some of them I've read, some of them I've already discussed with you in detail. And then the last one that I'm going to throw out there is this, The Sociopath Next Door. I don't know where I picked this up, but I know I picked it up here in the last couple of years. So I don't know why it wasn't on my list. And it's one of those that like I picked it up and I was looking through it deciding if I thought I could read it here real quick. And then I'm like, hmm, I wonder where this came from. Is it on my list of my book hauls and what video did I cover that in? And it did, I didn't cover it anywhere. It doesn't show I covered it anywhere. Um, so just throwing that out there to you. It is nonfiction. It says Chilling Accurate Portrayal of Evil, The Decent Person's Guide to Indecency by Jonathan Kellerman. One in 25 ordinary Americans secretly has no conscience and can do anything at all without feeling guilty. Who is the devil you know? And then um, it's got another little section, uh, The Ruthless versus the Rest of Us. And it's written by Martha Stout uh, with a PhD. So thought it sounded like it would be super interesting. It was published in 2005. That's on my to be read list. All right, that's it for book haul. Let me clear the desk. All right, I can't imagine that you are not like me because you're watching my videos, you relate to me in some crazy way. Um, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So I know on this video, I or on this video series, I often say, hey, here's my short stack, here's what I'm currently reading, here's what I'm reading next. And then yeah, a couple of videos later, you're like, she's never talked about that book again. Did she finish it? Has she even started it? Who knows? Like my to be read list is detailed and crazy and never seems to follow the exact path it's supposed to, but that's okay. We're going to deal with it here for a few minutes. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. This will be super short, promise. Um, I've been videoing, it says two hours and 30 minutes. I will cut that down, obviously. So this will be short, uh, but I do want to show a couple here to you and tell you like, here's what's coming. I'm almost finished with this. Five Feet Apart by Rachel Lippincott. Um, there's a copy in my classroom and I have a copy on my shelf. So I had a student that was reading my copy in my classroom and I said, hey, I need to read that too. I'll just read it with you. And then I only got about halfway through and school year ended, um, but I will be finishing that in the next couple of days. This is the one that I'm currently listening to. Um, I keep listening to it as um, we are taking breaks here. And don't you hate it when your phone doesn't recognize you? Like who else? It's me, I know, it's me. Um, I have 19 minutes left to go on that audio, but I also have the copy here. I love it. Go get this book, go get it right now. Um, so, so good. Um, I am gonna read this Pleading the Fish by 
Bree Baker, I don't know where I picked this up, but I'm gonna read this in the next um, week or so for a Killing Time with Cozies chat that needs to be a summer cozy. I am, oh, here's the new um, Agatha that I need to read by June 30th. Perot Loses a Client featuring Hercule Perot. It is also titled Dumb Witness. This is one of those, again, crazy things about Agatha. Um, Death on the Nile, I'll probably just re-listen to this because I have read it. Um, I have copious notes on this, so it should be pretty easy just to review. And then our book club is meeting the end of this month and we are reading West with Giraffes by Linda Rutledge. Um, this has gotten great, great reviews. I'm very excited about that. So I will be reading that during the month of June. Let's move this over. Um, on Killing Time with Cozies, um, a couple of the spinoff uh, um, people that host that show are doing a Murder, She Wrote marathon. Um, I don't often take part in these reading, I don't know what they're called, challenges or whatever, but Murder, She Wrote, how can I not? And look at all of these that I have. So, um, not this one, not this one. There we go. All of these are Murder, She Wrote, and I am gonna start with Jen and Daggers, which I'm pretty sure is the first one. Um, and I'm super excited about this because I've been wanting to read it. And then, uh, you know, I might not read all of these during the readathon, but some of them I have, and I've talked to you about. Murder on Parade, which I might do July 4th. Um, A Fatal Feast, which I might do this fall. Um, the Fine Art of Murder, maybe I'll do that one during this. And then Panning for Murder, I have that. So I would like to read the ones that I have or even listen to some of the um, audios maybe while I am in Florida. I told you I think that I'm going to Florida. This would be um, some good ones to pick up on audio. Um, and then I do have a couple of spinoffs. Murder, She Meowed by um, Rita Mae Pie and Sneaky Brown Pie. Sne Sneaky Pie Brown. Oh. And then um, Kate Conte's Herder, she wrote. I think both of those would be fun too. So we're going to stick those in a stack and then think about those. And then um, I've had a couple that I keep telling you that I'm going to read. And so just throwing those back out there. Holy Moments. This will be another um, short devotional that I need to read this summer. The Subtle Art of. <clears throat> this one I borrowed. So I, again, just want to get it read. So the next time I see the person who owns that, I can give it back to them. I purchased this and I've been reading it. Why has nobody told me this before, but I keep setting it aside. That's on my short stack. I'm gonna do that this summer. My next Colleen Hoover is Ugly Love. So I'm gonna read that this summer. I borrowed, I know to Shannon, stop borrowing books, but I borrowed Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zavine. Um, and I plan to read that one this summer and Demon Copperfield. So a little bit on my summer reading list, short stack. Wanted to share that with you. Um, so that you know what's coming up in case you want to read some of those so that when we discuss, we can discuss together. But um, just wanted to catch you up on a few of those. I uh, also want to throw out there, and I did, I went to a retirement party Thursday, and he said, hey, have you watched this series? It's really good. I said no, but I knew it was going to be a series, so I'm glad to hear it. Um, it is by Yang, Y-A-N-G. It's American-born Chinese. I read the book a number of years ago. I want to say it was a graphic novel. I loved it. Um, and now Disney Plus is doing it. Now mine says that it hasn't been released. It was supposed to be, or no, I read it in July of 2016. That makes more sense. So I will add a Goodreads to that and then see if I can check that out um, and watch that on Disney Plus and let you know how that adaptation is. Last video, I did lots of books to movies and I'm gonna try and keep you up to date on that. So stay tuned, not today, but stay tuned. I did receive a couple of book related um, things here at the end of school. Let me grab one of those. All right, so maybe not the end of school, but for my birthday in April, my son and his uh, fiance gave me this. It's the Harry Potter um, Vera Bradley backpack. It's a great little size. I have been constantly um, carrying this with my you know, extra purse things in it. So my smaller purse and then my bigger purse. Are you that kind of a person? I am. Um, so, you know, this has all the things that are always in here and um I, you know i just i love this it's a great little it's a great little backpack and it's harry potter it is so well done vera bradley i love it one of my students for teachers week teacher appreciation week gave me this i've already given it a bit of a workout um it's my weekend is all booked it's absolutely lovely it's on this really thick canvas and I asked her because it didn't have a tag in it. I asked her where she got it and she said, Amazon, like I do everything. She also gave me like a, a Tumblr that said, I'm reading. 
Um, I love it. I'll have to show it to you in another video because it's over there and I don't want to go back over there and get it. Um, but I will add that in there. And then another one of my students, where is it? The last days of school drew me this. How lovely is that? It's Agatha Christie's Partners in Crime. And then she gave me this little um, like ornament that will stay in here. I love it. It says just a girl in love with books and it's got the books on the back. I mean, it is so lovely. It's on like a piece of wood. So thank you, Ashlyn. I hope you're watching. Thank you. Thank you, Bella, for my bag. Thank you, Harbor and Hunter, for my bag. So I wanted to share a few of those things with you, as well as a couple of other book-related things. I've had this little purse, which is such a cute little carrying thing. It's made out of two Reader's Digest condensed books. It's lovely. It's got this um, like paper graphic material here two leather straps. I don't have a clue where I bought this. I don't remember, um, but I know I've carried it a lot and it has endured. I love it. Um, and I think I have an Etsy link for one that is similar. Um, and I will put that in the notes. We have been traveling quite a bit and I know it's old school, but this really does work well. It's a little clip um, book light for when I'm in the car and I don't want to turn on the big light and, you know, endanger John's driving, but you can clip it right on your book. Um, I can also use it in bed. I don't normally do it um, so much in bed as much as uh, when we're in the car. It's just easy to clip on there and do a little bit of reading in the car. Um, and it is by Mighty Bright. So if you're looking for a book light, I thought I'd throw that one out to you. Um, also, on dare my birthday, someone gave me this bookmark. It's a BYOB, bring your own book. You never know when you may need it. And it is by Callan, K-A-L-A-N, so throwing that one out there to you. And then I think I've shown you this. It's the Square Shop on Etsy. You can buy book-related things, but I finished filling it this side up in April of 2023, and I don't think I've had time to um, show you that I filled it up. But I always just put the author, the title, the date that I finished it, and then the star rating on there. Um, and I just wanted to show you that because I think I showed you that before, but there it is filled up. My little deck chair here for my books is from um, thinkinggifts.com. Okay, we're done. It is now one o'clock, so I've been filming for a couple of hours here. Looks like two minutes and 40-ish minutes worth of um, film that I will edit down for you the best I can. Um, I am so thankful that you uh, watch my videos, share my videos, encourage me to make the videos, comment on my videos, Talk with me in real person when you see me about my videos. Um, talk to me on Facebook about my videos. I just really, really enjoy sharing the love of reading, um, the love of books, being able to give you books that give you um, information and entertainment and being able to connect the right person with the right book. It is my mission. Um, this really fills the void of me not being able to actually be employed as a librarian, which I hope to return to someday but it fills that void for me. And I love that you seem to love it enough to watch it, share it and comment on it. As always, all of the books that I talk about, you can easily find at your public library for free on Libby through your public library for free um, or easily thrifted or purchased in an independent or regular bookstore. Like I said, I am equal opportunity. I thrift, I do yard sales, but I also visit my independent bookstores. I buy from Barnes and Noble, I buy from Amazon. Hopefully we were all out there for the right reasons of promoting the love of reading. Ah, just a few things. I know I said I was done, I'm not. I've been catching up on my podcast since summer started and a couple that I'm just gonna link below for you. Um, the Aggressive Life is by Brian Tome. He's our pastor at Crossroads here in Cincinnati. Um, and he had a great one where he talked to um, someone local who was tracking down a serial killer, interviewing a serial killer, having to be a, pr a prosecutor, I think. Super good conversation. Um, the podcast, Buried Bones, it's about true crime, cold cases. I know I have some listeners that really like that genre, as well as I do. And I'm going to link one that was on there that was so good. It was talking about when someone sounds guilt guilty versus how you can prove it. Um, NPR's Consider This had a great one. Fresh Air, there was a conversation about Clarence Thomas that I don't know enough about, and I was glad to listen to that. I Will Teach You to Be Rich by Rich 
ram it, ram it something. <laughs> um, such a good one, but I enjoyed that one. So I'm linking it for you here locally. We have Jungle Gems. I talk about Jungle Gems a lot. I listen to their podcast. They have one on candy and toy section. So I'm linking that. Um, Rich Roll, who is a great health podcaster, has a great conversation on heart health. My sister had an issue last year, so I'm very aware of heart health. Um, and then this past weekend, my senior boys kept saying, hey, do you listen to this podcast? You talk about podcasts all the time. This is a great one. And it was this past weekend, and he did an interview with Malcolm Gladwell that was phenomenal. Now, Rich Roll, this weekend, um, especially those two, they're very long podcasts, like two and three hours sometimes. But it's another thing that I listen to when I'm working around the house, driving, puttering, watering the plants, that sort of thing. They go by very quickly, and I really enjoy just learning something while I'm doing those mundane tasks. Let's be social, connect with me through the links, Facebook, Instagram. I am always sharing book-related news, what I'm reading, what I finished, Goodreads reviews. Hit the subscribe and like button so I know that you're enjoying these recommendations and videos. Comment, email, message me, especially if you're looking for something in particular. Let me know what you're reading, what you want to read, what you're looking for. Keep in touch, folks. I so enjoyed having you with me this Saturday morning in my lovely library. Keep in touch, enjoy.